One of the benefits of having been in this space such a long time is that I can look at the past to predict where we may be going in the future. And as this legendary thinker said, if you want to know the future, look at the past. Well, there's another more contemporary legendary thinker, Doc Brown, who said, let's go back to the future. And I'll come back to this at the end of my talk. So this story of flexible endoscopy is actually quite young. It's about two thirds of a century now when Basil Hershowitz invented the fiber optic endoscope, 1957. And you see him holding the flexible endoscope. You'll note that there is no biopsy channel, so at that time it was just to look inside of the gastrointestinal tract. But that's when the journey started. And the first intervention was made possible by integrating a working channel called a biopsy channel because that's what was first done. Passing a biopsy forceps through the working channel to get biopsies. And this is where our partnership with industry then started because the company started developing these catheter tools that we needed to be able to perform therapeutic interventions. And these include extraction, injection, cutting, coagulation, dilating, ligating, and recanalizing. And for each of these, we have a large armamentarium of tools available to us. So there has been an explosive development over these past decades. And if we look at the early therapeutic interventions, we can group these into three categories. The first is polypectomy, the second stopping bleeding, and the third is unclogging the lumen. This is our bread and butter. This is what we do as endoscopists every day in our practice. And I want to emphasize polypectomy because this was truly at its time revolutionary. It was the first true therapeutic intervention. And Shinya developed or designed the polypectomy snare back in 1969. And he published on this in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1973, polypectomy via the fiber optic colonoscope. And what is unique about the endoscopic approach and was the selling point for endoscopy in contrast to all other imaging modalities was that one could perform one-stop shopping. So at the time of diagnosis of a polyp, the endoscopist could immediately perform therapy and remove the polyp. And this is a theme that continuously recurs and accounts for the incredible advancements that we have seen in this field. Now, if you look at stopping bleeding, we have here so much innovation that has occurred. I categorize them in these three, three groups. Coagulation modalities using contact methods, heater probe, gold probe, many different types of probes and non-contacts such as APC. We can inject, we can inject sclerosins, it can be glue, for example, for varices, and we can like it. We have mechanical methods using bands, clips, and loops. All of these incredibly innovative platforms at the time that they were revealed or emerged. Today, they have become part of our toolbox. Unclogging the lumen, that's a big part of our practice. Some have called endoscopists clogologists. That's a word that David Fleischer used. We can extract foreign bodies or native bodies like stones in the bile duct using balloons, baskets, and nets. We can dilate the tract with bougies. And we can use balloons. And we have a wide array of stents, plastic and metal. And we have uncovered, partially covered, and covered stents. So here too, an incredible explosion of technology. But the historic indications for endoscopic th therapy can be abbreviated or shortened by the three Ps. The first P stands for palliation, 
It is exemplified by stenting. To palliate the patient with that obstructing cancer, to give that patient a better quality of life, for example, the ability to eat. Prevention, exemplified by polypectomy, to prevent the cancer from occurring later on. And third, the prohibitive risk patients. These are the patients the surgeon does not want to touch because the patient is inoperable. And that's where we play a very important role. But in this millennium, a paradigm shift occurred, whereby we were using lesser invasive alternatives to surgery. Now we started to introduce treatments that qualified really as the primary treatment of choice. In other words, we have transitioned from complementary treatments to surgery to competitive treatments. And to enable this transition from complementary to, compar to competitive, there are three key procedural milestones that I'm going to cover. And the first is endoscopic resection of neoplasia. The second is the closure of defects and holes. And the third, EUS-guided interventions. These are the key milestones that have allowed us to project forward so rapidly. So if we look at the evolution of endoscopic resection, it started with Shinya with polypectomy, 1973, New England Journal of Medicine. It then evolved in Japan to EMR, where the first reports of resection after submucosal injection of fluid enabled the resection at a deeper level in the submucosa to curatively resect mucosal lesions. And then it evolved to ESD. Now, after injecting into the submucosa rather than using a snare, we use a dissecting knife to dissect the submucosal free, and we're not limited by the constraints of a snare. But the most recent advance has been what we call pocket ESD. Because now that we discovered that we can get into that space, we can create that space in the submucosa, we could actually drive our endoscope into that submucosal space. That's in 2003 when this was first reported. And this is where we endoscopists were introduced to a space that really was not known to us before. We call it the third space, the submucosal space. To distinguish it from the first space, which is intraluminal, the second space is outside of the wall, so the peritoneum or the mediastinum, and that third space is in the submucosa. And because we can access that space, expand it with an injection, and then we can drive our scope into that space, and we can create a tunnel inside of the space. And this allows us now to resect from inside the wall, and we can resect mucosal lesions using the pocket method that I just described, but we can also curatively resect submucosal lesions, lesions below the mucosa, by completely enucleating this tumor and then removing it. So just think about how revolutionary this is, where we now can curatively treat submucosal lesions. But if we go one level deeper, we can incise the muscularis propria. And this led to the poem revolution, where we could treat achalasia with e-poem, or we could treat Zenker's diverticulum with z-poem, or we could treat gastroparesis and pyloric stenosis with g-poem, all using the same techniques whereby we are in the submucosal space and now we are selectively incising the muscularis propria, either partial or full thickness. But if you go full thickness, through the muscularis propria, well, now you're inside of the first space, and this is essentially what is notes. Something that we played with very briefly in the early 2000s at the turn of the millennium, but now is resurging. 
So we're going from the third space, submucosa, to the second space, that is the terrain, the space of the surgeon. We're now going into the surgeon's space, and this is the report by Inui in Japan in 2019, describing a fundal plication after performing a e-poem for echalasia. So he shows in these pictures very nicely how using standard tools, clips and loops, how a fundal plication can be created from inside and then you can safely close the tunnel opening with clips. The second enabling procedural milestone is the closure of defects and holes. Now this goes, of course, hand in hand with the first, with endoscopic resection. If we look at the evolution of defect closure, we heard earlier about clips, that's when it all started. I was very fortunate to be in Hamburg and perform the first use of clips to close a perforation. This was in a patient who had a perforation after resection of a GIST tumor. But this then evolved to the development of over-the-scope clips, or I really call them clamps because they really don't look like clips. So clips are through the scope. Now we have over-the-scope devices that allow us to achieve deeper and more robust closure. And we saw the evolution, the emergence of suturing devices, first with the endocinch in uh, 2000, and then the overstitch device in 2008. And most recently, we have the XTAC device, which has these helical anchors that we place, and we can tie these anchors together with sutures. But also, we have seen an evolution of clips. So clips have continued to evolve, and now we have larger clips with longer prongs, but we have clips with hook-like edges, these jaws here, closed in three steps to allow us to obtain more robust clip closure. And we even have a, a dual-action tissue approximating clip where you go for one edge first, close, and then go for the opposite edge, close and just bring those two edges together. So you're not limited by the space between the prongs. So we're seeing evolutionary advances even in the clip technology. If we have devices that can close holes, we are now able to go full thickness. So our resection, it started with polypectomy, and then it went deeper into the submucosa. But now we can go full thickness and we can resect uh, GIST lesions or neuroendocrine tumors, and we can even potentially curatively uh, resect deeply invasive cancers, T1B, even T2 lesions, perhaps maybe with palliative intent because it may not be curative, but it may provide additional survival for our patients in those patients who are not good surgical candidates more clever has been the introduction of the non-exposed methods because even if we can close a hole, we do have that moment when the contents of the GI tract, which are not sterile, can escape into the extraperitoneal space. We can eliminate that risk of contamination of any violation of the extraintestinal space with a non-exposed me uh, method using the full thickness resection device. So this is basically the over-the-scope clamp, OTSC, but it has a snare that is integrated into the tip. So after the clamp is placed above that clamp, the snare is then deployed to cut the lesion so that we don't risk any exposure of the outside environment. Another method is one that I have been working on and continue to work on, which I call the RLUB method, retract, ligate, unroof, and biopsy, where we forcefully invert the wall. We're pulling the serosa together with the serosa. We ligate the base, and then after ligating the base, we can resect the lesion. So perhaps this might be something that will also be available for a non-exposed method. Now our ability to close holes with suturing devices or with H-tag uh, devices allows us also to remodel the GI tract. So this is an area where we 
that already exists and I'm sure is going to evolve further. Currently, we can perform the TIF procedure, stands for transoral incisionless fundoplasty. It's not fundoplication. That's what was done as notes by Dr. Inui. That was fundoplication. This is fundoplasty. So all that we're doing is creating a plication and we are reinforcing the anti-reflux valve by inverting the esophagus, pulling the esophagus down and creating this nipple here to prevent reflux. Similarly, with the ESG procedure, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, again, it's not gastrectomy, that's what the surgeon does. This is gastroplasty, so this is a remodeling of the stomach. So we haven't removed any of the stomach, it's 100% organ preserving, but we have reduced the lumen and specifically that area between the upper body and the antrum. We have reduced it to become more like a speed bump to reduce the passage and slow down the passage of food so that the patient feels full faster. And the third is EOS guided interventions. I'm saving the best for the last now, of course. So we've seen this remarkable evolution of EUS started with imaging in the 80s. We could only look, we couldn't touch. With FNA, still diagnostic, we could sample. But the real excitement has been in this millennia with therapy. Now EUS guided therapy has the advantage that the scope remains inside of the lumen. With our ultrasound eyes, we can see outside organs, vessels, ducts, and pathology. And it allows us to precisely target these structures with our accessory, a needle, for example. So we could target nerves, do celiac neurolysis, vessels, injecting glue, coil, tumors, injecting chemotherapeutic agents, or performing RFA. Ducts, we could target a duct and we could perform a rendezvous ERCP coming from above, anterograde, to assist ERCP. And we could drain fluid collections with stents. But I think the real jewel in this crown of therapeutic EUS has been the development of the anastomotic stent. And that's something that has been my passion for this past decade, working on the LAMS, the lumen opposing metal stent. The concept here is we want to create an anastomosis, not just drainage, but to create an actual port so that we could advance our endoscope through this port into that extraintestinal cavity or space. And by the way, this picture right here is the very first time that I saw the inside of the gallbladder in the pig model. This is back in uh, around 2006 or 7 when we were using the very first prototypes of the lamps. So now we're going from unclogging the lumen to actually performing a bypass with an anastomotic stent. And so we can do this with, in ducts whether we're targeting intrabatic ducts, the common bile duct, the cystic duct, or pancreatic duct, using the LAMS. You saw examples of this earlier. Or we can connect different parts of the gastrointestinal tract together and perform gastroenterostomy or an enteroenterostomy. Essentially, anything that we can target with EUS, we can then create an anastomosis. And so the LAMS has been a port for direct transluminal therapy for necrosectomy in the gallbladder, we can perform lithotripsy and stone extraction. In the gall and we can also perform polypectomy, maybe even EMR or ESD in the gallbladder in the future. And if we have a patient post gastric bypass, we can now enter into the remnant stomach without having to go the long route around with our double balloon scopes and perform ERCP and other intervention. So if we ask ourselves, what is the future of interventional endoscopy? Well, Doc Brown said, back to the future. And if we look back, 2004, 2004, that's 20 years ago. That was the birth of notes. And the concept of notes then was completely radical that the endoscopist could go use the natural orifice to perform surgery interventions outside the gastrointestinal tract. 
And for this notes revolution, various platforms that enabled triangulation were developed by industry. All of these, the USGI Cobra, uh, Boston Scientific, Direct Drive, Olympus Samurai, the Storts, Anubis, I used all of these back when they were available as prototypes, but they all died because the notes epic came to a standstill when it was realized that we couldn't solve the problem of closing holes, which we can now solve. And now we have robotics. Now I personally don't know whether robots will be become mainstream inside of our practice, but they certainly have with the Da Vinci for our surgeons. Maybe looking one day at a driverless endoscopy, like this prototype here. So sometimes you have to be a little careful what you wish for. I'll leave you with this quote from Abraham Lincoln. The best way to predict the future is to create it. So that's the most important. As long as we are the creators, we will remain the masters. Thank you very much.